There are crowns waiting for all those who follow him. <clears throat> Interesting thing, though, is that you've got to be giving those crowns back to him because they're his. Amen. And because we're first fruits, that's why we get crowns. And he is the first fruit. The first fruit. This is the barley harvest today. Barley harvest being the first harvest. And it is actually um, not fit for human consumption, they say. It's barley. It's supposed to be only fit for animals. I don't know about you, but I really like barley. Yeah, put a bunch of barley in your stew. It really adds something to it, doesn't it? But the Jews figured that barley was only good for animals. And the word barley actually in the Hebrew is talking about something that's um, eh, kind of unrefined. Um, but we'll get more to that. The preacher sought to find out acceptable words and that which was written was upright, even words of truth. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. I'm going to talk about first fruits today. And we look at 1 Corinthians 15, chapter 15, verse 20. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. So he's the beginning of a new thing. And we're going to open up at chapter 20 of the book of John. John 20, and we're going to go through verses 1 to 16. These are relevant for what we're talking about today. Now the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Peter, Peter therefore went out and the other disciple and were going to the tomb. So they both ran together, and the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen cloths lying there. Yet he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. And he saw the linen cloths lying there, and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. I'm told that that's a sign that I'm coming back. I don't know how true that is, but that's what I've heard. Then the other disciple, who came to the tomb first, went in also, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not know the scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again to their own homes. But Mary stood out light outside the tomb, weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. Then they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? So she said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Then now... When she said these things, or when she said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him, Rabboni which is to say, teacher. This is the 18th day of the first month of the sacred calendar. Now you remember from last week, there are two calendars in, in, the, in, in Israel. You have the sacred calendar, which began in the spring with the new moon of March in this particular year uh, in our calendar. 
And then you have the secular calendar, or new, new year that starts in uh, um, Rosh Hashanah, which is in the fall. So there are two new years in Israel. And this is a sacred year, and this sacred year was brought about uh, when God told Moses to begin the f sacred year at this time, which is in the spring. So where that's where we are right now. And in the uh, sacred calendar, it's the month of Abib. Abib is a Hebrew word that means green fruit. The first, the first fruit is green. And uh, it's also called Nisan, which I really like because Nisan means miracle. Now, the new moon was on March 21st this year. March 21st, which means that if you, when you count that, you find out that the 14th day ended up last Saturday, the 14th day, which was the day of purchase of the lamb for the Passover. Now, I went all, all over this uh, last week, and I'm not going to go over it thoroughly this week because of that. But just let it be said that the uh, calendar is, is, is kind of the same as it was at the time that Jesus was crucified this year. So we are actually in the right day for resurrection, the right Sunday. New moon was on March 21st, 18 days later. It is Sunday. That is the April 9th. That's today. And uh, Jesus was crucified. You know, go back 2,000 years. He was crucified on Thursday. And then three days later, he rose again. And that's today, right? And inc incidentally, uh, he was crucified on, at a new moon. I mean, a, a full moon. And uh, Thursday was the full moon. It was the full moon. <clears throat> so Wednesday evening, Jesus and his disciples observed the annual Sida, which is the Passover meal. And Jesus was arrested just a few hours later in the Garden of Gethsemane. And, uh, you know, <laughs> no matter what day you, you celebrate this on, it always has the same meaning, right? Well, after he was uh, arrested, there was a mock trial, and uh, then he was brutally treated by the people, the guards that had brought him in. And, you know, you can see that we really need to be changed, don't you? When you think about the way he was treated, he was, they say that he was unrecognizable. He was treated so badly. Um, now, I don't know about you, but I, can't, I could never do that. I could never do that. But who, who is it? I mean, what, what sort of people can do that sort of thing? People without God, that's what sort of people. But I tell you, honestly, even before I was saved, I don't know that I could have done that. But some people can. And even some of the people who can do that sort of thing, they can be changed but only by Christ. Nobody else can do it. And this idea that we can change ourselves, we can make ourselves better, is just, uh, it's, it's a fairy tale. It's just not true. Well, after the mock trial and the brutal treatment by the palace guards, Jesus was hung on a cross in fulfillment of the many prophecies that were recorded in the Tanakh. Tanakh is the Old Testament of the Jews. It's a Jewish uh, Bible. Well, it's really interesting. We have to understand that the Old Testament is full of prophecies that uh, were talking about the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and what it all meant. And, but nobody knew. They didn't know what it was. And the reason is because prophecy is not fortune-telling. Prophecy is giving you a picture of something that is going to come about that hasn't come about yet. And until it comes about, you can't tell what the picture is. The example I like to give is of the cross, right? The cross is standing there and the light of God is shining on the cross and it's casting its shadow back thousands of years. 
Well, the people back before the cross are seeing the shadow, but they can't see the cross. They don't know what it is that's casting the shadow, right? Well, that shadow is in the way, in the, in the form of words and uh, parables that are given all through the Old Testament. Uh, just one, for example, I'll mention this again. Uh, psalm 22 is called a messianic psalm because it's all about Jesus on the cross. If you read Psalm 22, you actually see a description of somebody hanging on a cross. It was written 1,000 years before the cross. How could anybody know? They couldn't know. They had no clue what that was all about. That's the way it is with prophecy. God's prophecy has to be seen after the event occurs. Before the event occurs, we have all sorts of speculation, and you see that going on with the book of Revelation. Tons of speculation. Everybody thinks they know what, what, is, what it means. You know, there are going to be a lot of surprised people because you can only know what it means after the event. God did not give us a crystal ball. What he gave us was validation of his word. And it's a big difference there, right? So Thursday afternoon, as lambs were being sacrificed all over Israel, the Lamb of God breathed his last and was taken off his cross and placed into a new tomb. Jesus spent 12 day, or seven days there. Yeah, so? No, it's three days. Because seven and three are two very special numbers. Seven is a number of completion. On the cross, he said, it is finished. Then he spent three days there and three nights, and three is a number of deity. Three is a number of perfection. And God is perfect. So, he spent that time in the tomb, and this was already prophesied. Jesus told us about it in Matthew 12, verse 40. Matthew 12, verse 40. For as Jonah was laid three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. It's a very important thing, this, because this is one of those shadows that was cast by the cross. Jonah actually is born of Amittai. And Amittai is the name of God. Now, I'm not saying that's his proper name, but Amittai actually means uh, righteousness. And Jesus is born of that. Another thing that I'd like to mention about this too, because uh, a lot of people have wondered about the fish, right? He was put in the belly of a fish for three days and three nights. Um, the, the, a lot of talk about whether it was a whale or some other type of fish. But I want to tell you, this again is prophetic. When you really look at what the word means. In the Hebrew, the word that's translated fish is dog. And it's actually meaning to vibrate. And the idea is that like a fish's tail, moving, vibrating. But if you stop there, that's all you see. But if you think that there's other reasons for vibration, and you move into looking at the roots that make the word dog up, you find out that it means terror. Terror. So vibrating is more likely to be shaking in terror. Are you all following me? And that's exactly what Jesus did in the Garden of Gethsemane. He shook in terror. And so much so that he was bleeding from his capillaries. It's called hematridosis. It's where your blood comes out, comes out like sweat. And uh, that's, that happens in cases of extreme terror. So he was in terror. 
So when he's in the belly of the fish, he's talking about him being in terror in the grave. Why? Because he's taking our place. He's in hell. Right? And you see that in the second chapter of Jonah. As a matter of fact, the whole description of him being in hell is that is Jonah in the body, in, the, in that fish for three days and three nights until God releases him. Right? And we've got the same sort of thing. So again, this is a matter of uh, uh, shadows, types and shadows that have been cast into the Old Testament which could only be understood after the event. The seed of the woman had to be planted in the earth and the power of God was at work in the darkness of the grave. See, in the third chapter of Genesis, God said to Adam, Look at what you've done. Uh, what, have you, what have you done, Adam? You've made such a mess of things, but I'm going to fix it, right? Isn't that, isn't that what he said? And how's he going to fix it? The seed of the woman. Seed of the woman. And then all through the Old Testament, it talks about the coming seed, the seed. The seed was uh, moved from uh, uh, there to um, from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob, there was always a forecoming of the seed. And Jesus is the seed that was talked about all the way through here. And the interesting thing to me is because uh, the Bible is actually uh, an agricultural thing because there's a lot of talk about agriculture, right? Different uh, types of, gr of grain and so on. And uh, so... Jesus is a seed that's planted in the earth, right? And as he's planted in the earth, he starts to grow and he gives forth fruit, right? Well, who's the fruit? We are the fruit, right? He said, I am the vine, you are the branches. We are the fruit. So, a seed is placed in the ground, a change begins to take place, and it ceases to be a seed and becomes, or begins to become something else, something completely different, but still related, right? Different, but related. Something that was locked up in it and was just waiting to be released. And you see that with the caterpillar. When a caterpillar entombs itself in a cocoon and goes to sleep, it un undergoes a remarkable change. And at the end of the process, it emerges from its prison as a brand new creature with a brand new appearance and brand new exciting abilities. Able to fly. Well, I don't think it's too far off to say that Jesus is able to fly too. <laughs> and, and, and we will too. <laughs> Jesus entered the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, a wounded and bruised corpse, even as the taula, the crimson worm that Jesus is compared to in verses 6 to 7 in the Messianic Psalm 22 that I already mentioned. Here, look at this. Just these two verses, 6, and six to 8. I am a worm and no man, a reproach of man, and despised by people. All those who see me ridicule me. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head saying, he trusted in the Lord. Let him rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. That's Jesus on the cross. Absolutely. But that's not the only section. The whole, the whole, uh, every, every verse of that psalm is, talking about him on the cross. But here's one of the really things that's really important here. Uh, this particular version here, right here. I am a worm and no man. And you can think, what am I, what's he saying? Is he saying that he is worthless? He's certainly not saying he's worthless. 
because the worm he talks about is the tawla. The tawla is a very special worm. It's a worm that was crushed in order to receive the dye for royal garments. How about that? So he's not just a grub. He's saying, I am the one that's being crushed that you will receive royalty. Amen. Isn't that something? Now, none of the explanations, whoops, I'm going a little bit too far here. Somehow, after midnight on Saturday, Jesus emerged from his tomb completely restored to his eternal state, his eternal state. Then there is this mysterious reference to graves being opened and the dead appearing to many while he was still on the cross. Now look, we just talked about him being on the cross and, and then uh, being resurrected. But before that resurrection, there has to be a death. And that's where he is at this point. In Matthew 27, verses 50 to 53, Jesus is on the cross. He says, Jesus passionately cried out, took his last breath, still on the cross, right? And gave up his spirit. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked, and the rocks were split, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the city, into the holy city, and appeared to many. Now, I don't know how many of you have read these passages. But when I read these passages, I said, wait a minute, there's a problem here. Either they're misplaced or there's something else going on here. Well, I think it's a little bit of both. But we know that Jesus was on the cross, he cried out, he gave up his spirit, and the rocks broke, and there was uh, the, the tearing of the uh, veil. These, and these are miraculous signs, aren't they? Right? There's kind of an earthquake going on, and the veil of the temple is torn, not from bottom to top, but from top to bottom. And the interesting thing there is that when you look at the Greek, it would be better said, that it was torn from above to below. Are you understanding what I'm saying? This was by God. It was torn from above. And I know it says top, but I'm telling you, if you look at the Greek, it could also say from above. And it would be more likely to, it, to be right that way because no man tore that, that, that veil. So... Here it is talking about Jesus still on the cross and then there's all sorts of uh, uh, miracles going on including people coming out of their graves and walking around the streets. And I thought, something just doesn't fit here. Now, does that mean that the word of God is wrong? No, it doesn't mean that. What it does mean is that sometimes man doesn't see what God's saying, right? Right? So I want to tell you what I think. Now, I'm, I just lay claim to this myself. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong, all right? But it's up to each person to decide for themselves. But I'll tell you this, does not fit. You know it doesn't fit. And if you start to check it out, you'll find out. And when you try to find out what the great learned people have said about this, they're all saying the same sort of things. There are two or three different theories about what's being going on here. Uh, nobody can seem to agree, but here's what I'll tell uh, what I think. If I look at the uh, at the original language and start to move beyond what it looks like on the surface, for example, the word soma in the Greek means a body. But what's a body? What's a body? You can say a body is this thing that is uh, that I'm emanating. But a body can also be a ship, right? A body can be anything that's solid, okay? But you know what's important is that in the Hebrew, in the Greek, the word soma also means 
that which casts a shadow. And you can check it out for yourselves. I'm not lying. You know, it says that which casts a shadow. All right. I can stand here and cast my shadow. The cross can cast a shadow. But a shadow is also uh, something that you see, but you don't understand what it came from. All right? So what is it that they can see, but they didn't know where it came from? The prophecies in the Old Testament. That's what they couldn't see. I mean, they, could, they, they knew it was there, but they couldn't see it. They couldn't understand it. So when you put it all together, if I take the word um, soma and just change it to that which casts a shadow, and then I look at the graves, the graves were opened. What are graves? Well, in the Greek, the word for graves is, uh, means memories, memories. Memorial this is where we get the word memorial from, as a matter of fact. And so what we have now is memories that are casting a shadow. You following me so far? Memories that are casting a shadow. And people, they've got these memories, but they don't know what these memories mean. They haven't got a clue what they mean. But suddenly, they know because now they're opened. The word for open means understood, realized, realized. And so now they know that what was said in the Old Testament prophecies has come about. Now we understand what those old prophecies was, were actually saying because here it is. And even with the word resurrection at the end, because it says, and coming out of the graves after his resurrection, we see that's the wrong place. He's still on the cross. But they put resurrection in there, and they should too. But the problem is that resurrection doesn't just mean coming back to life. The word in the Greek also means becoming cognizant of something to become understanding of something. So if I put it all together, here's what, here's what I get. The prophecies of the Messiah were opened up and many of the types and the shadows that were cast, that were forgotten, were remembered and they saw the prophecies fulfilled in the crucifixion of Jesus. That is, the memories of the prophecies left by the Old Testament prophets were understood by many because of the events occurring at his crucifixion. What were the events that were occurring? Earthquake. Temple veil being torn. Um, and not only that, but you read in all three of the uh, synoptic gospels that the gods at the crucifixion said, truly, this was the Son of God. Why? Why did they say that? Because they were impressed by what was going on. They were impressed by the, the phenomenon that were taking place at the time. In fulfillment of all these prophecies, Jesus became the first fruit. The term first fruit reveals much about God's plan of redemption. In the natural world, first comes the bud, then comes the flower. But the flower falls off and the fruit appears. God does not harvest buds or flowers. He harvests fruit. Fruit is what he's interested in. The term first fruits also speaks of new beginnings. It was on this day of on this day of the barley harvest, about eleven centuries before Jesus' birth, that Ruth, remember Ruth in the Old Testament? Ruth, who represents the believer, or I might even say the church at large, 
She laid at the feet of Boaz, and Boaz was a representation of Jesus, and he is guarding the grain, right? Is that what he does? He was there asleep, guarding the grain, and Ruth was laying at his feet, and that's actually a symbol of marriage. So she lays at the feet of Christ on the threshing floor in the midst of the grain. On this day, the believer is joined to the Lord in promise, but a debt remains until Pentecost. So with the barley harvest, that was the beginning. And I could compare the barley harvest to a bride and a groom receiving their, their vows. But then they've got to wait until the marriage bed for consummation. You follow me? Without consummation, the marriage isn't complete. We have the same sort of thing with the barley followed by Pentecost. Right? At the barley feast, we have the vows in the, in the marriage. And then 49 days or 50 days later, you have Pentecost, which is the consummation of the marriage, of the union. Got it? On this day, the believer is joined to the Lord in promise, but a debt remains until Pentecost. Now, the Hebrew word for barley comes from a root that means roughness, as in unfinished, until the 50th day. It was only fed to livestock. The wheat used for human consumption was harvested seven weeks later during Pentecost. So the term first fruits implies to the beginning of the process what might be called the redemption process. The disciples were instructed by the Lord during the week of weeks, which is 49 days, and the Holy Spirit was given on the 50th day at Pentecost. So you have the vows and then you have the consummation. And do you remember the significance of the number 50? 50 days later, right? Here's Pentecost. 50 is 49 plus 1. So 49 is seven sevens. Seven is the number of completion. Seven sevens is an augmentation of that completion. And what do you have now? You have Jubilee, which is the forgiveness of a debt. Right? Through Jesus of Nazareth, God canceled a debt that we could never repay. Remember, Philippians 2, verses 6 to 8, tells us that Jesus Christ, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross, which is hideous, really hideous. You know, he could have, if it was a matter of, well, you know, take a bit of poison or something like that. But to undergo the punishment that that man, and here's the thing, at any time he could have said no. That's what's so important here. Because you can say that about any other human being, you know, well, you know, a lot of people have suffered. But no, no, no. None have suffered like this with the opportunity at any time to say, no, stop it. And he, he let it go through. And remember, this is God in the flesh, right? That's why it says, who being in the form of God did not consider robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation stripped himself of his deity in order to be one of us that he'd be qualified to pay our debt. Amen, amen. We can readily see our need for a deliverer in the actions and the behavior of his persecutors. Isaiah 53 verse 7 says he was oppressed and he was afflicted yet he opened not his mouth he was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before his shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. Jesus died as he had lived. 
with courage and nobility. All the events leading up to his death served to establish the true nature and purpose of Jesus. And in like manner, all the events following his resurrection served to establish his faithfulness to accomplish what he had promised. Because of him, we will not taste death. That's Hebrews 2 verse 9. Because of him, we can stand with confidence before a holy God, not in our own righteousness, but in his, wrapped in his garment of righteousness. We can stand insulated from the perfection of God, standing in his perfection. And I'll tell you what, electricity means you no harm, but if you grab onto a live wire, you're going to get hurt. Right? God means you no harm, but if you don't have the insulation of Christ, you will be hurt. You understand? It's exactly the same principle here. Jesus is like that glove that you put on before you grab a wire. Because of him, we can stand confidently. You know, I know that it says we can go boldly into the presence of God. No, you, you go confidently, confidently, not boldly. Because of him, the kingdom of God has embraced the sons of Adam. That's in Luke 17, 21. Because of Jesus, all of creation, all of nature can anticipate deliverance from corruption and a renewal in a new heaven and a new earth. That includes all the creatures. You know, when Adam fell, he took everything with him. That's the problem. But when God comes, he takes everything with him. And you and I have decisions to make, but the poor animals don't have any decision to make because they don't need a decision. They didn't make the decision to begin with. So the animals, and that's why it says that the... Uh, the lion will eat straw like the ox and you know, the, the, the kid will play with a snake and all that because it will all be changed the way it was supposed to be. Because of Jesus, we can choose who we serve. You know, we, we were born... With a choice, folks. We were born with a choice. Only because of Jesus. Before Jesus came, there was no choice. But now there is. And, you know, it goes all the way back to the Old Testament where in Deuteronomy, God says, choose this day who you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, right? Because Jesus rose from his tomb, we have hope. Before that, there wasn't any hope. Jesus is the firstborn among many brethren. That's Romans 8.29. We go back to Colossians 1.13. Jesus delivered us from the power of the devil. We're not under his thumb anymore. Oh, we can still agree with him <laughs> foolishly, but we don't have to. We're not under his thumb anymore. Jesus is the firstborn. So you believe all that? I know I do. Jesus is our glorious king. He is our debt payer, our redeemer, and he has promised us his strength to overcome the temptations and the perils of this world. And in the life to come, he has promised a union with himself that transcends anything that can be accomplished in the natural. We can only taste what is ahead for us. It's beyond our comprehension. It's almost like we can just, well, you tell, it's like the Scottish theologian says, it's better felt than telt. And here I, I use uh, 1 Corinthians 2.9. 1 
which is as close as we can come, I think. As it is written, eye has not seen nor ear heard nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. We're, we're just going to be shocked in, in the most pleasant way, I think. <laughs> Hallelujah, what a Savior. So now in the fellowship of the Beloved, let us share his table as members of his body in the communion of the saints. So 